The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Among the many things to give thanks for this coming holiday weekend, farmers. It's agricultural week in Ontario and tonight we'll find out why producers more than ever want you to buy local. Then from our Ontario hubs, what's got activists in Hamilton putting their names on the ballot in this month's municipal elections. And from home care for people with dementia to Ontario's rollout of $10 a day daycare, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, October 7th, and that's coming up on the Agenda. Agriculture is a huge sector in this province, adding billions to the province's economy, and even more importantly, feeding us. With us on how farmers are faring as they bring in this year's harvest, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, dairy farmer Peggy Breckfeld, who is president of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. And in Guelph, Ontario, Sarah Epp, assistant professor in the Rural Planning and Development Program at the University of Guelph. Hello to you both. Hi. Hello. Uh, Peggy, I want to start with you. What are farmers most concerned with right now? Well, to be fully honest, we're just concerned, can we get the crops off? Is the rain uh, go ever going to stop? And uh, I think most farmers find that the, the critical mass of today and this season, outside of that, we are concerned about uh, the pressure on farmland and trying to uh, preserve it. We are concerned about the cost of inputs and interest and uh, fertilizer, etc. as we try to make a living. And we are always concerned about do we have enough people uh, to help us get the work done that needs to be done. Well, you mentioned uh, the pressure on farmland from the 2021 Census of Agriculture. It showed Ontario is losing 319 acres of farmland, and that's daily. Um, can you that's help right. put this into context for us? Absolutely. That looks like 75,000 carrots or 25,000 apples, or if your evening includes a glass of wine, it it's about 1.2 million bottles of uh, VQA wine. Um, and about 50 city, 58 city blocks, I believe. And you're putting in, the, in that context to help us understand that when that farmland goes, so do those products that we rely on. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it, there's a lot of pressure there. Um, I, I think people sometimes forget that when you look way back where cities were first established, they actually looked for food, water and shelter. And so some of our best farmland is actually where the major cities are in this province. Uh, Toronto, you used to look from the CN Tower and see the majority of the class one and two, the best farmland. And now when you sit at the top of the CN Tower or stand at the top, uh, you, you pretty much see city. Hmm. And uh, slowly but surely, you lose the farmland that actually feeds the people that live in that city. Sarah, help us understand this a bit more. I think the percentage of farmable land in this province is 5%. Is that correct? Yeah, it's around that. And and Peggy's absolutely right. The best of the, the farmland that we want for absolutely for farming purposes is in those places where we see the greatest development pressure. So in southern Ontario, there's there's absolutely pockets of soil fantastic in northern Ontario for agriculture. But the bulk of that soil and, and the ideal climate is what we see in the southern part of the province. And that's where we see the majority of these urban land use conversions happening. And, and sort of it's a sacrificial land in some ways for development, the, the best farmland. Well, um, explain that more a little bit. What are the key causes for this farmland loss? So it's very much focused on urban development pressures. We know the province, I think over the next 20 years, is going to get four to five million more people. So we absolutely know we need a place for people to go. We need homes. We, we if anybody read the affordability housing task force report, we absolutely know we have a housing crisis in Ontario right now. So one of the solutions is to build more homes, which absolutely makes sense. The challenge is the, the easiest thing to build on is farmland. And it's green space. It's really easy to bulldoze over um, the, the vineyards that Peggy mentioned or just to pull up those carrots and, and put a subdivision down. And because it's easy and it's cost effective and in some ways, it's very easy to say from a development perspective, here's where we should we should continue to develop. We should continue to sprawl out. Let's continue with the trend in Ontario, which is that sort of low-density suburban sprawl that we see that has consumed 
thousands and tens of thousands of hectares of land within the province. And we see that continuing today. And, and it's not something that's necessarily going to slow down because we know that population growth is continuing. Well, the province um, has a lot to juggle, right? Uh, we know that the pandemic kind of uh, pushed into the spotlight this um, uh, the lack of affordable housing. A lot of people who lived in the cities in southwest Ontario moved out, um, driving up the cost of uh, housing in other places. Um, but I want to know from both of you, and Peggy, I'll start with you. How much of this farmland loss uh, has to do with poor urban planning? Well, I think I'm going to switch your question around and talk a little bit about what kind of solutions could there be. Mm -hmm. And one of them is really good, effective, long-term uh, urban planning. Every time we build in and up Every time we renew and review downtown cores, we have the opportunity to actually protect farmland and actually makes lots of sense inside of the urban footprint as well. Um, your transit lines make more sense. Your infrastructure makes more sense. I, I build less roads that I have to maintain. I put in less sewer systems or uh, less lights that I have to uh, uphold and, and keep going. Um, those types of things, as well as you build livable, and uh, complete communities when you think inside of the urban footprint. Uh, and when you think inside of the urban footprint, you actually protect farmland outside of that, and that's gonna feed your city and continue to do that for generations. And Sarah, you know, I think a lot of us might not have that in mind about what's happening with the loss of this farmland and how it's mm -hmm. going to impact us. I think a lot of these things we find out later when it's too, uh, we can't really reverse course. Um, so I'll ask you this question, uh, how much of this farmland loss has to do with poor urban planning? I would say poor urban planning is challenging because a lot of the decisions and a lot of the development we see happening today still to this date is based on decisions made decades ago. And so the, the nature of planning is it's supposed to forecast 30 years out. That's our goal to be aspirational and have all these incredible plans that are, are predicting the future and planning for the future. And so one of the challenges is that a lot of the land we're developing today are based on previous decisions that today we look at and think that's ludicrous. Why would we keep paving over this farmland? But those decisions were made five, 10, 20, in some cases, 40 years ago. And we're just seeing those the, the impacts of those decisions play out now, which means we're kind of at an exciting time right now where we can change that course. We can stop this decision-making of urban boundary expansions where we allow farmland to come into an urban boundary because we know eventually we may need that land. And look to, as Peggy said, look within those urban areas. Let's build up, which is always a triggering word or triggering phrase, build up. We, we don't want to build out anymore. Intensification, density, these are all words that get a lot of people very very upset. But we do need to reflect on that and look at that within our urban boundaries. Rural communities have urban boundaries as well. Look within those and find those opportunities because those decisions that we're making today are going to likely be catastrophic in 30 years because we don't really understand those long-term impacts. And Peggy, you mentioned uh, you wanted to look at solutions. Uh, is there an example you can give us of a town or a city in Ontario that's actually doing it right? Yeah, actually, Waterloo has done a really good job of uh, focusing on how do we stay inside of our footprint. They actually have one road that you can see. This is the countryside, the farms, and this is the city. And I think it, it includes conversations about what kind of housing do we actually need now? Um, 40 years ago, when some of the uh, goals or, or assessments were made, we were looking at a lot of large families. They needed large single detached dwellings. More and more people today, they have, they need a home for one or two people. You need student housing. You need um, more and more seniors at uh, very small units. Condos and such are a way forward. Waterloo has redesigned and renewed buildings. They put uh, commercial on the bottom and put condos on top. They have what's called the pearl necklace. And so at each transit station stop, you see an increase in housing. And then you see the next increase around the next one. So you see that going through the city, you can actually see it on their landscape. And they have put on people's deeds that the current house, uh, perhaps a single detached dwelling um, is there. And when you buy it, on there is a note that says, should you ever want to make changes here, uh, this is going to become, we have made plans to put in multiplexes or more than one family dwelling on that lot. So they are very much looking forward. What can we do? Um, and Sarah, is the, green is the green belt sufficient for farmland? In to protect it's sufficient it? for farm. 
Yeah, it's sufficient for farmland in the areas it is right now. We we have seen, I, I, with a colleague, Wayne Caldwell, we did a, a very long study from 2000 to 2017, which we're now going into 2021 with, looking at farmland loss within the green belt to see if the green belt worked. And, and it has. It's done exactly what it's supposed to have done up until about 2017 to where our data goes. But there's so much more prime agricultural land outside of that area that isn't protected. So if you're within the green belt area, yes, there are very strong policies that protect that land currently. And municipalities are respectful of those. It comes to the province to change those those rules. But there's land outside of that that's just as good that doesn't have protection. So if we're looking at the green belt, it's doing a good job. But what about the land that isn't protected, where we potentially see leapfrog development happening because we can go to these areas where we don't have that really strong policy in, in place? Um, as we mentioned before, 5% is not a very large number. Uh, if, in, if Ontario keeps losing farmable land to urban development, do you see uh, a scenario where we have to rely on other countries for food. Peggy? Well, I, I think there is always a concern about where our food comes from, and it should be. We should desire to buy some of the best quality food there is in Ontario. Um, we do export a lot, but in an export market, you are. You are at the at mercy of a, a market, and geo geopolitical events climate change and uh, climate events such as severe drought in certain countries. When the Ukraine happened, uh, the Ukraine war started, we actually saw the price of sunflower oil skyrocket. And we heard a lot of people say, where is the wheat that's going to feed Northern Africa going to come from? Canada has the opportunity. We grow more food than we actually need as citizens. We have, I think, the opportunity, but also the responsibility in a larger global market and global context to feed more people than we currently uh, have inside of Ontario. But don't we already rely on imports here, Peggy? Imports do come in, but we actually export more than uh, we import. In Canada. Uh, and Sarah, I think uh, during the pandemic, a lot of us uh, got really nervous about access to food. And, you know, we, I started doing my urban farming in my backyard. Um, do you think there is a disconnect for people who are not part of the farming community, um, who just kind of you go to the store, it's there. And if it's not there, then you go pick something else. And if that's not there, that's when you get upset. Yeah, I think there's a huge disconnect of, I mean, we see the stickers all the time, farmers feed cities, and, and that's fantastic and it's accurate, but I still don't know that we recognize the impacts of that and the impacts of when we don't have farmers, what that looks like in our grocery stores, if that's where we're buying predominantly our food from, and the cost that's likely going to be attached. We hear right now how, how terrible the food costs are. That's going to get worse if we aren't supplying ourselves as much domestically as possible. And, and you're right, we already do have imports coming in, so we know that even during peach season, you'll find peaches from the U.S. in our markets. And so it's a matter of really educating the public of where their food comes from and how they can support farmers through their purchasing decisions on a daily basis. Every time I hear peaches, I think of uh, the Justin Bieber song. I'm like, you're getting peaches from Georgia. Hi, missed opportunity to promote Ontario. But, you know, he's learning. Um, Peggy, uh, you mentioned fertilizer earlier. Uh, the Ontario government yeah. has earmarked $2 million for a made in Ontario fertilizer solution. Why are investments like this so important? It's one of the major inputs for, for farmers as they look at their um, operations. We need to feed the plants and feed the soil. And so farmers do, they, they take soil samples, they uh, look at the nutrients they can put on if they have livestock, what the, that will look like and how that will help the plant. And then they use synthetic fertilizers to balance that. Uh, this year with the war on the Ukraine, we saw the uh, tariffs go on to Canadian tariffs go on to the um, the fertilizer coming from Russia, and it affected Eastern Canada, uh, basically up to the Ontario border, because beyond that, uh, Western Canada can source uh, from other places. So uh, we we saw the price rise significantly. The answer that. Uh, the Ontario government has provided is that continued research into new and innovative uh, research and development of products that will help us uh, continue to reduce emissions and use fertilizer uh, effectively. Uh, farmers already want to do that and do do that because the cost of fertilizer is so high 
but these the funds announced we're pretty happy with because they are one solution mm -hmm. to trying to ensure we can continue to grow the food that we do. Um, another important link um, for development to happen is MZOs. Sarah, can you explain to us what those are? Yeah, so MZOs are ministerial zoning orders, which essentially sort of skip the public consultation process, and it's the provincial government through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing making decisions on local planning matters. They are controversial, to say the least, because it does skip that local planning decision, and they've been criticized heavily lately as a way for development potentially to skip that local process and get approval from the provincial government and just push development through without the right consultation or review. And there are a number of situations in the province where we've seen that happen on farmland, including prime agricultural land, so the best soil we have, getting pushed through large development applications through the province that have skipped that local planning authority. Well, Peggy, you know, I think one of the arguments that the province has made is that we have to move faster. Uh, <laughs> the housing is uh, so unaffordable in this province. It's having a ripple effect on everything. Um, so how do you balance those two things? Preserving farmland and uh and a housing strategy don't have to be opposites. In fact, it's a case of that if we look at our precious resources, we tend to value them and treat them special and different. We're saying to the province, there's lots of opportunities to build houses and create more homes inside of the urban footprint, um, looking at other land choices, but uh, we do need to protect, protect the farmland. How are we going to feed people um, if we, pave it all over because once it's in pavement, it never goes back. In uh, Even in communities such as mine, Thunder Bay, my grandmother remembers where the, the farms actually started uh, way back about halfway through the city at the uh, Waterloo corner. There's a KFC there now. I personally remember where there was, um, where there was um, farmland and chicken farm, a very large chicken farm, probably about 10 kilometers away. And it's all, it's all houses and development. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't build in and up, but we now have a lot of infrastructure. Talk to Thunder Bay. We have a lot of roads to maintain. We have a lot of street, street lights and sewer lines that we have to maintain because we continue to sprawl out and we lost farmland in the process. Well, Peggy, your dairy farm, oh, Sarah, I'll come right back to you. Um, your dairy farmer in Northern Ontario, how different are the pressures faced by farmers in the North as opposed to the South? So, I, I do believe that the best, I'm going to be straight up, <laughs> the mm -hmm. best farmland is in that GTA area. Um, you, I, class one and two is down there. Northern Ontario has excellent opportunities for canola, for grains, for beef production, etc. cetera. Um, class three, four, five, we are farming on, um, but your best farmlands in the south. The pressures in the north, yeah, we can still grow a little bit of farmland. There's still a little bit under trees, but overall, that pressure is still there. On our own farm, we had 45 acres that they have now divided into three housing lots and that we can farm a portion of it now because not all the houses are built or, or uh, developed yet, but we know that we're going to lose that farmland. And yeah, that's it's houses now. It becomes houses. Sarah, I know you wanted to follow up. I was going to note that the, the challenge and risk in all of this is called the death by a thousand cuts. So as we sort of carve off a bit more farmland, and as Peggy said, there, she can still farm where she is, but it's going to be three houses, that slowly severing of farmland cuts off more and more of the farm, and eventually it makes that individual farm Un unattainable. You can't use it for anything anymore. And the greater risk is that it makes the farming system in that community uh, useless, essentially, because you don't have the volume of agriculture, you don't have the services available, the infrastructure, the population. And so that death by a thousand cuts really weakens the, the agricultural base. If we, if we lose the land, agriculture is essentially null. And then beyond that, it also weakens the rural community. And, and the viability of many rural places is dependent on that agricultural base. And so it's interesting and, and frustrating to think of that death by a 
thousand cuts where we have these small, small expansions that don't seem significant, but on the long term and taken together, they're, they're, they're quite an issue. Uh, Peggy, World Mental Health Day is coming up on October 10th. Yeah. Uh, a recent study by the University of Guelph states that farmer mental health got worse during the pandemic. Uh, this study shows that one in four Ontario farmers contemplated suicide in the past 12 months. OFA yeah. has uh, partnered with the Canadian Mental Health Association to introduce a farmer wellness initiative. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the statistic you just said is is pretty scary. Um, another one is 76% of farmers have self-identify as having moderate to high stress. And uh, we, we live in an agriculture with a dash between. <laughs> and uh, the culture says, just keep going, keep working hard, uh, never say die, uh, never give up. We also live in homes that and farms that are all one unit. So our family, our farms, our businesses, our animals, everything is in one place quite frequently. And so it's hard to get away. If a counselor says, uh, well, you need, just need a vacation, that doesn't seem like an option to a farmer who generally farms 24 seven uh, to keep their animals healthy and safe, et cetera. And so uh, the conversation is to encourage farmers to reach out and say, it's okay to say I'm not okay. And there are people that do understand what farming is. So you can call actually a toll free number. It's one eight six six corn all is <laughs> kind of the letters for it. Um, but the, the goal is to say, farmers, don't be afraid to reach out if you're having trouble. The inflation, the interest rates, uh, bad weather events, animal health, those are all stressors just on the farm. And then you have the ordinary stressors of family life and human health, etc. So it is a complicated life, but um, there is hope. And we often say hope sustains a farmer. Um, don't don't give up, reach out. That's a great initiative. Uh, we only have about a minute left and I've, I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple questions. Uh, Sarah, the municipal elections are coming up on October 24th. Uh, given that municipalities are often the first place where land use zoning decisions are made, what would you like to see happen there? I think just representation of the agricultural community at the councillor level, if possible, is critical. We know farmers are already outnumbered in the province and in many municipalities, but having that representation either of councillors who don't understand agriculture getting that, that knowledge and education base, or the farm community being a part of that municipal election, I think is critical to make sure an agricultural lens is brought to all decisions that are made at a local municipality. Regardless if they're planning issues, their economic development issues, that agricultural lens is critical. And Peggy, since most Ontarians don't come from farming backgrounds, what should voters be aware of when they cast their ballots? Think long term. Think about where your food's going to come from and think about how if you build your city right, um, if you do long term visioning of your city, you probably will make great decisions uh, for your tax dollar and efficient use, but also protecting farmland. So farm and food forever. And this weekend is a long weekend. Families are gathering um, as we head into Thanksgiving weekend. What is one thing we can do to support local farmers? Sarah, I'll start with you. I'll maybe take the unpopular opinion and say, have the political conversation this weekend. Every family talks politics whether we want to or not. And I think this is a great opportunity to talk about the local elections and, and the role of farmers in agriculture. So push that, that complicated, difficult conversation. And Peggy? Look for Ontario. Uh, produce, buy local, buy from the store with the Ontario uh, symbol, Foodland Ontario symbol. It, it tastes great. 200 different products. Uh, you can find something that's made here at home. And Peggy, on behalf of Ontarians, thank you so much for all the work that you farmers do for us, uh, helping us uh, healthy and uh, having accessible food. We appreciate everything that you do. And thank you so much for Sarah for giving us this insight as well. We appreciate your time. Thank you. In just over two weeks, Ontario voters will choose their municipal representatives. Justin Chandler covers Hamilton Niagara for Ontario Hubs. He's been watching some of the races out there and finding out why some activists are trying their luck at the ballot box. And he joins us now from Hamilton for more. Welcome, Justin. 
Hello. All right, is there anything about community organizing or activism that lends itself to making a good city councillor? Well, what I'm hearing from uh, some of the people who are running and from the politics professor who I spoke to about this, um, it's the people who, who run from a community organizing background. They know a lot of people, they're engaged in local issues, um, and they're generally very knowledgeable about how to get people together and interested about important topics. Is there a concern at all that, you know, activists and politicians should sort of be separated, uh, that there are sometimes maybe maybe there should be two different pools and maybe an activist doesn't necessarily make a good politician? I don't know that there's necessarily a concern, but there's definitely this idea that you can be kind of making change from within the system or from outside the system. And that's what I spoke to uh, several organizers who are running for office uh, about. So the idea that uh, maybe it's better if you're pressuring elected officials to do something versus saying now, oh, you know what, maybe I should be one of those uh, elected officials. And that's something that everyone who's uh, making this uh, leap has had to grapple with and decide uh, where they best fit in and how best they can make change. All right, let's talk about some of the councillors uh, or the, the would-be councillors that uh, you have chatted with. Uh, in Hamilton, Linda Lukasik, she is well known as an environmental activist. She's running in Ward 5 and is looking for some change in the selection. What, what did she tell you? Yeah, she said uh, that being as there's no incumbent running in her ward, which is actually the case in several in Hamilton, there's going to be a lot of new faces on council, including a new mayor, so that'll be an interesting race, uh, that she felt that there was a good opportunity to make some change and that she really tried to evaluate for herself, um, am I most effective uh, in what I'm doing now and working with Environment Hamilton, raising awareness, organizing around issues, or can I be most effective as an elected leader? And uh, for her, she felt that that was the best choice in taking uh, what she cares about and running for office. All right, let's move to another familiar face. Kojo Damti, well known for his work on the grounds there. He's running in Ward 14. Feels like city governments are resistant to change. I'm curious though, how does he think he can work within that? For him, he said it's all about centering oneself in community. So he talked about uh, this idea that if he gets elected, he'd love to create uh, sort of neighborhood level councils so that there can be groups of people in different neighborhoods who will get together, talk about issues that matter to them, and then they can kind of report back to him and he can kind of show them how to delegate or bring those issues forward to council. Um, but he said that it, he thinks it's really important to be super engaged with um, all of one's constituents uh, to try and figure out what matters to them. And then if there's problems making change or doing what people want, being honest and upfront about that and uh, really explaining like, hey, this is maybe not happening as fast as we wanted, but here's what I'm going to do about it. So I guess constant communication was an important thing that he brought up. All right, let's move to a War II candidate. Cameron Crutch says, working outside the political system can be better. Uh, what are his reasons for running? Well, he said that really that's sort of because there's preconceptions about how councillors should act. So he mentioned sort of ideas around whiteness, heteronormativity, uh, being a little more corporate, sort of an idea that a counselor should be a certain type of person, which is something that he says he wants to push back against. Because he said he does think there's a lot of value in being actually up close and, you know, getting in on how the sausage is being made and being able to uh, try and more closely affect changes than from the outside. But he said that that does sometimes take a cost because people will have to um, or feel they have to conform in a certain way in order to get elected. And then, you know, the thing with that some voters may say is that activists may be sort of single issue candidates. Uh, you spoke to Anthony Frisina, an, an accessibility advocate running in Ward 8. What did he say about that when it comes to knocking on doors and people asking him about, you know, what are the other issues at the table that he's willing to fight for? And really, he said he cares about all sorts of issues. And um, just because he's known for accessibility doesn't that mean that that's the only thing that he knows about. Um, and he also said that for that matter, these are all things that connect. So accessibility is something that has impacts on, on the economy. It has impacts on the environment. If people are able to get around the city accessibly on transit, uh, get to jobs where they can work, you know, if accessibility, there's an angle on housing as well and on keeping people safely housed and uh, able to participate fully in society. So he said, really, these aren't things that are, are siloed and that just because someone's well known for uh, speaking on one topic, uh, that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that they're going to make any changes about. As you know, in the coming weeks, uh, constituents all across Ontario will be voting and, and looking for their candidates and mayors. I'm curious, you know, you've been following this 
sort of counsel in Hamilton for quite a while, uh, and very big names as well. Do you have an idea of which races might be some tight ones that uh, people in Hamilton should be looking at? Well, uh, definitely Ward 2 is going to be interesting. Um, the municipal race is going to be interesting. It's hard to say without um, local polling data, which isn't something that I've really been able to see or review as to sort of who has uh, a great chance there. But there's there's a lot of really interesting races. Any of these races, like Ward 5, where there's no incumbent, for example, is one that I think uh, people are going to want to watch. But there's also some where there's maybe one incumbent and uh, one other candidate running, um, I believe, in sort of the northwest part of the city. That's the case. So really, there's going to be huge changes on, uh, on council and a lot of cities that's not happening. So I think Hamilton's uh, election is definitely going to be one to watch this fall. And before we go, um, what else are you looking at uh, for this upcoming municipal election in terms of stories? Well, I'm interested in about acclaimed candidates, so cases where uh, there really is no competition and people are just getting brought in. I'm interested in online voting. I'm interested in making sure that people are able to uh, get the information that they need to know about polling accessibility. So, you know, there's, uh, there's no shortage of things uh, to look after in the hammer. Well, look forward to seeing and reading all of that. Justin Chandler, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. The agenda this week assessed the viability of home care for dementia patients, considered how to improve history education, spoke to author Marsha Liederman about her memoir as the daughter of Holocaust survivors, and sat down with the new U.S. ambassador to Canada. The agenda's week in review begins with Ontario's rollout of $10 a day daycare. We know from the STARS reporting that our coalition of for-profit daycares put pressure on the government to make changes to the program. Was your daycare one of them? Um, yes, that's right. And I am on the advisory board uh, of uh, Minister of Education, uh, C. Flashy. So we have been definitely putting our side of the story and uh, how we were concerned and we are right now. So for, for profit for us, the operator like us, we had a concern about the bottom line. Um, about our investment, uh, the invested capital in the centers that our franchisees, our partners have put in. And they are almost like a million dollar project from a scratch to build it up to the entirely ready for the community. And uh, the other areas that we are concerned, like how they are going to cover under this program, the cost of the loan, mortgage interest uh, of the investment, monthly mortgage, that payment requires. Um, it is a serious consideration for them in, in this new funding, how they're going to accommodate these things and how we can remain like financially stable. Do you so think it's unfair? Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. No, I was just going to say, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I think a lot of for-profits are there to fill the gap that was there before, um, something that the government failed to do in the past. But do you think it's fair to have, you know, a PR agency and to do this without the involvement of all the players? Uh, shouldn't everybody be at the table to discuss this? For sure, um, I totally agree. And uh, they have uh, quite a bit of non-for-profit uh, representation and uh, to represent themselves. But for profit, uh, they have now, as they are inclined, they, as we heard, like they have extended from September, and it was supposed to be the end date. They had it now November, which is fast approaching. They try to get different parties on board to hear. And uh, as we heard from our Toronto Star Investor Group, that uh, they have uh, they have come to know that how they have lifted up that cap that they had it initially on the profit margin. And also a lot of the other things they are trying to talk about and still there are some gray areas that we haven't got the clear answer, but at least they have the representation on the board to, uh, they are hearing their concerns, they are trying to uh, see what the concerns are and where are we coming from and what is, and because definitely the one assurance that we are getting here is they cannot fulfill the community requirement without the fair share or without having for profit with them partnering in, uh, in this CWLCC agreement. So definitely they need us to partner there and to provide that big role to 
properly execute and meet the need of the community here. Okay, I want to come to Cassidy next because I can I can hear you. You're having uh, a reaction here. Um, go ahead. Oh, uh, you know, I just can't believe that we are having a, a, a serious conversation about for-profit centers' bottom lines when the majority of child care providers in Ontario aren't even being included in the program. Like, I really can't believe that we're having a, a serious conversation here about the financial stability of profit-based businesses while most families who are attending home-based childcare aren't even going to be eligible for this program. That's the real conversation that needs to be had. And to sit here and sort of listen to someone fight for, well, I should be able to pay my private mortgage with public funds while I'm sitting here caring for families who aren't gonna see a dollar of this because on every level of government, uh, you know, home providers are largely ignored. Because unlicensed, being an unlicensed daycare has home excluded provider, us you're not even from part the of the conversation. And you know, we're yelling and screaming, "Look at us! Look at us! Why are we not being included in this? Why is there not being framework built to figure out how to create oversight to disperse the funds?" I mean, this is a larger conversation because there obviously does need to be proper oversight to ensure that funds are used appropriately. Um, and it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And so obviously with unlicensed, because there's not a lot of direct oversight at this time, I'm not advocating for funds to be dispersed to individual people like myself. But what I am advocating for is for there to be an overhaul of the current system. Licensing needs to be re-examined. The government needs to stop farming it out. It needs to bring it back under its own wing and it needs to create framework for the people who are the backbone of the childcare industry to be included. Dementia, I guess, is an umbrella term, which means a lot of different things. So give us your best and simplest definition of what we're talking about here. Sure. So think of dementia sort of similar to the way we would say cancer. It's an umbrella term for a range of diseases, up to 200 types of diseases that can have memory loss associated with it. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease is the most common, along with vascular dementia and then a range of others. And what's the most compelling theory as to why we seem to be seeing so much more of it these days? an aging population. Age is one of the strongest risk factors related to dementia. Jennifer Ingram, is dementia easy to diagnose? Uh, dementia is uh, not, I wouldn't say, easy to diagnose, but generally speaking, it becomes very self-evident to the families that we deal with. And if the history is presented to physicians, it can be relatively easily identified. It's uh, more difficult if it gets very complex, if the individual has multiple conditions. And there is a process that we teach everybody to go through to uh, make the diagnosis, uh, whether they are in a primary care setting or in a specialist setting or on a team, um, it, it needs to be identified. Unfortunately, it's often not identified in a timely manner, and that's where Linda and I have done a great deal of work. Let me do a quick follow-up with you. Do you believe there is still some stigma around a diagnosis of dementia? Oh, there's terrible stigma around the diagnosis of dementia. And most of us working in the field uh, work hard to make people live their lives fully and to avoid feeling the stigma as much as they do. It will take quite a bit of societal change and um, a great deal of improvement in the care system to allow people to live fully out in the community. And that's really where most of us in the world of dementia care hope to see the healthcare system move is into the community in a fulsome manner. Well, let me pick up on that with Linda Lee because I think we've probably got six hospitals within a 15 minute drive of this studio. But I want to know what it's like if you've got dementia and you're living in a rural or remote part of Ontario. What are your chances of getting served under those conditions? It is challenging. Uh, it's challenging for lots of reasons. In primary care, the system of care doesn't support the time and the expertise that 
primary care family practice has to make an early diagnosis, particularly early on in the stage of conditions when many different things can affect memory and can cause memory symptoms. So getting that timely diagnosis, getting the interprofessional care team that can help with that diagnosis, a physician that's knowledgeable in that area uh, to uh, make the diagnosis, which is the gateway to services and supports in the community that help people to stay at home longer, that's a challenge in some of the more rural and remote areas. And when you say a challenge, does that mean there, there are simply parts of this province where you're not going to get served? Uh, well, that's changing, and, and some of the work that we've been doing as well has been to uh, try to make a more timely diagnosis to enable primary care to do a lot more uh, so that people can get that timely diagnosis and a plan of care, uh, services and supports in place early on to prevent crises that result in healthcare destabilization and use of hospitals and long-term care transition. There's, there's a lot of work being done right now uh, to, to help that along. Gotcha. Charlene Stewart, we've had you on this program many times because you represent the, um, well, what should we call them? The front lines. You represent the front line people who are dealing with this issue every day, trying to help people through the difficulties of dementia. Talk to us, if you would, about some of the pressures that the people you represent are facing as they try to do their work. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to be back, Steve. We've been having so many conversations about the crisis in healthcare. Uh, this is a real important topic, and we need to have more conversations with decision makers at Queen's Park about this. Um, my pan panelist saying about the um, early intervention and being able to diagnose, that's what home care providers do. It's the continuity of care to begin with, that when a home care provider is visiting you know, residents at home or clients at home, um, being able to have that continuity would mean full-time jobs, which you know we have a, a human resources crisis right now. But that continuity means that me visiting a home, I get to know the client very well and can quickly identify those changes in personalities, in, you know, um, um, emotional activities, the early intervention and early diagnosis is so critically important. And because we've got such a critical staffing shortage, home care uh, actually is the, in my opinion, one of the most essential services, but yet it is one of the most neglected services. We don't pay enough attention to home care and we have to change that. The exciting news from Australia is that they've actually identified history as one of the four pillars of education. They've had a, a, that, that, that national conversation, which is what I would love to see us, us do here. Um, and it wasn't always pretty. Uh, you know, the, the history wars years were, you know, were, were complicated, but they've reached a point where they're, they've come to the agreement that history matters. And I think that that's the first step. Um, a diverse and inclusive history matters, and we have to expand the old master narratives and try and you know piece together something that includes a range of voices and perspectives and that's not easy um, but Australia as long uh, uh, along with countries as diverse as uh, Germany uh, Sweden Japan they've all managed to agree on a cumulative uh, elementary, at least, history curriculum, um, which is something that I think we lack. You know, we teach math year on year from grade one to grade 12. Mm -hmm. um, it seems obvious that, you know, we should do the same thing with, with history as well. But in Australia, you've got to take it all the way to the end of high school? I don't know that it's required all the way to the end of high school. It's certainly in the first few years, and they've certainly said we set it as, as a priority. Should um, we and do this that? Is, Yes, we yeah, should do that. Absolutely, 100%. Hmm. It's something, of, of course, that you know, uh, changes every few years. It's according to the capricious whims of who's in power and hmm. who's in the Ministry of Education and so on. Um, so you know, what was true last year may not be true next year. But I think this is um, this is a project that uh, you know is, is worth taking on and and it's worth investing that time. Anthony, there's a lot of cooks in this kitchen. You got the Ministry of Education, you got yeah. school boards, you got teachers, you got parents, you got students and everybody's got a good idea about what ought to or ought not to happen. As you look around, who, who do you blame? Who do you praise? Who do you blame for because it's this bad? Who do you praise because at least it's as good as it is? Well, I think the essence is sort of the philosophy, Steve, and I, I think really there's sort of four pieces to the arc of Canadian history. One is that this has been indisputably an absolutely great nation for the, probably the overwhelming majority of people who were born here or who have come here. The second part of that is that we have failed miserably in our dealings with certain groups, most notably Indigenous, of course, and, and black people, other people of color as well. 
The other things are that demonstrably through our history, human rights issues, equality issues have, have improved significantly in almost pretty much every field that you look at. The final piece of that, though, is having said that, they're nowhere near where they should be or where we need them to be in coming years. So it's, you know, it's a, a sort of a sweep of great successes marked by notable failures in certain areas, and that's the way that we have to tackle that now. You can't only focus on failure. You can't only focus on saying, look at us, we're so great. Okay, Chris Dummett, how about you? Where do, where do you like to point the finger at, if only these folks would pull up their socks, we'd have a better, educa a better educated populace when it comes to history? Well, I, I won't. I won't. I, I won't take on the whole question. I would say, in my world in the university, I think the dilemma is actually slightly different from what uh, Anthony Wilson Smith was just saying. I think the dilemma is a kind of a kind of over uh, over critical approach, which is has tended in its kind of over criticism to be somewhat parochial. Uh, so it, it's what uh, you know Roger Scruton, the British philosopher, called a, a kind of oikophobic approach, by which he meant the opposite of xenophobic. So not a dislike of foreigners, but a dislike of the self, a dislike of our own culture. And you know, I think this is a this is a genuine problem in university history teaching uh, today, in the sense that there's a there's an incredible focus on the the the, the you know the, the sins of Canada in, in a kind almost in, almost in a vacuum. Um, I'm struck struck by the the talking about the need to teach the Atlantic slave trade, which of course we did, and it's a fascinating and fundamentally important topic. But you rarely hear people want to talk about the Islamic slave trade that that you know sent you know almost e even more slaves up uh, uh, up Africa into the Middle East. It's an incredibly important topic, really unheard of in North America when we're so focused on just our own stories. And why do you think we don't teach th that aspect of the story? Well, I would say in the university world, it doesn't it doesn't criticize Canada, uh, and and it's just if if you're so focused on present you know political slash moral goals then that story doesn't fit your, does not fit to purpose. Christina, when you're in the staff lounge and you're, go not gossiping, I won't say gossip, when you're having a serious, <laughs> when you're having a serious intellectual discussion with your colleagues about that damn ministry or that damn school board or those damn parents or those bratty kids or something, who, who do you look to and say, we'd be doing so much better if not for what group? I don't know that I would necessarily lay the blame at uh, any any one group, but certainly going back to how we started this conversation, uh, we certainly need to start history earlier, uh, earlier on in elementary school. I how have early? children. I have children in grade two and grade four. That early. Take us back to your childhood. You ask your mother, "Why don't I have grandparents?" And what's the answer you get back? It was a very innocent question. I'd just been at my friend's house. She had grandparents. They seemed really great. They gave her lots of love and attention, and I wanted that too. Why didn't I have that? And my mother, I guess, was caught off guard, not expecting this question. And her answer, as I remember it, was maybe a little bit too truthful. She said, I didn't have grandparents because the Germans hated Jews and they killed Jews, and they did that by putting them in gas showers. You're how old at the time? Five, five years old. Yikes. And maybe that wasn't exactly her wording, but that was the story I walked away with. And my mind was, of course, swimming with all kinds of questions. Uh, Jews? I, I thought everyone was Jewish, because when you're five, you think your experience is what everyone's experience is. I was very young. And then, who were these Germans? Why did they hate us? Do they still hate us? In hindsight, is that a bad answer to give a five-year-old? It is a very bad answer. Just uh, confirming, yeah. Should I write a parenting book sometime? I will not uh, suggest any uh, brutal honesty like that. But then I was picturing these showers. What did they look like? Uh, did they look like our shower? And did gas come out of the, the shower head? And if so, how did that kill you? These were all these questions that were going on in my head. And of course, I didn't say a word. You grew up in what city? Toronto. You went to public school? I did. Did you get much? education in public school about the Holocaust? Zero. Zero? I would say between grades kindergarten and 13, I don't believe it came up hmm. ever. Uh, but uh, my parents sent me to Hebrew school after, after regular school, you know, four to six on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Sunday mornings. And there we learned about the Holocaust. 
At what point did you suggest to your mother, if ever, that the answer she gave five-year-old Marsha might have been a bit too stark? I don't think I ever addressed it with my mother, who died in 2006. I don't think I ever recounted that story with her. She probably would have denied it, <laughs> <laughs> and good on her. Uh, but the lesson that, that quietly taught me was be very careful with the questions you ask, because the answers could be extremely damaging. Uh, after that, I was very quiet about the Holocaust. My parents talked about the war. They talked about not having food. They talked about some sort of seemingly exciting adventures, or at least that's how it seemed to me as a kid. But then when I was seven at that Hebrew school, they showed us a documentary, which might have been Night and Fog, mm. but it included these horrific images of corpses being bulldozed into a pit. Mm. And I remember looking at those bodies and thinking, one of those people could be my grandmother. Well, one of those people could have been your mother. Your mother, and I mean, I, okay, you tell it, I shouldn't tell it, but your mother ended up in Auschwitz. She did. She was uh, 14 when the war broke out, and she was sent to the ghetto with her family. At 15, she was kidnapped on the street, that was her terminology, I think it's appropriate, by a Nazi soldier who made her set up a barrack for Nazis who were going to be overseeing the ghetto and then made her move in there the next day. Imagine a 15-year-old daughter, your 15-year-old, letting her be with these Nazis mm. living in that situation. The president did say, quote, instead of relying on foreign supply chains, let's make it in America. And I put make it in America at the heart of my economic plan. And when people in this country hear that, and of course, we're a big trading com uh, country, we wonder whether we should be nervous when we hear these kinds of statements. So I'm happy to say that Canada has no reason to be nervous. And um, yep, you know, elected officials and presidents um, say a lot of things, and they say them at different times in different contexts. The language you were quoting came from the State of the Union address where the president was trying to make a point about the importance of the integrity of United States supply chains, but most of the reference was dealing with the integrity of those supply chains as, in, as, as a defense mechanism against autocratic countries like China and Russia. They, those comments, by the way, were prescient with what has happened with Russia, mm. Ukraine and Russia trying to hold the world hostage with its energy, uh, with its energy exports, and it's, that's exactly the kind of behavior that the president was trying to protect against. So I would, I would refer you to almost contemporaneous comments, mm. which were a joint statement made by the president and the prime minister on the one-year anniversary of the roadmap for a renewed partnership between the United States and Canada, which, first of all, sets out a comprehensive strategic and tactical partnership based on six pillars of the United States and Canada working together okay, but even to advance economic interest. And on that one year anniversary, in that statement, there is a line in that statement which talks about the importance of the United States and Canada working together to preserve and to grow the integrated supply chains that form the basis of an economic relationship between the United States and Canada. Ambassador, that's all great. Except, I have to remind you, there are times when this administration has put bills before Congress about Buy American, which requires our people to go down there and start lobbying like crazy to get the Canadian exemption. <coughs> so we wonder how much you love us, actually. Well, let's talk about Buy America, Buy American, two different concepts, by the way. Um, first of all, it is a common, both of those principles apply to federal procurement only. So they're not protectionist in any way whatsoever. Um, a, protectionist, a protectionist approach would limit 
Canadian business participation in the overall trade and economic relationship mm -hmm. with the United States. I'll remind you <laughs> that th that trade relationship is 2.6 billion Canadian dollars a day. Mm -hmm. It is Canada's largest trade relationship. It is the United States' largest trading relationship. And on top of the national figures, more than 30 states in the United States count Canada as their number one export partner. That doesn't sound very protectionist to me. But it we talks about, have to remind you of it that all talk, the time. Well, you don't have to remind me Not about you, it. But you don't have to remind me about it. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it is simply a common element of f national procurement policy to at times favor businesses located in the country spending the money. Mm -hmm. Canada has, by Canadian policies, in its federal procurement. And uh, as recently as COVID procurement, Canada, um, imp Canada implicated its by Canadian standards to limit purchases of COVID supplies, personal protective equipment to Canadian businesses in an explicit by Canadian policy. So these are not, I mean, they, these are not tensions. They're the way countries do business. Um, and. It's simply, I mean, Canada doesn't have to come down to Washington and beg to, for waivers and carve-ins and things like that. It's just all part of an ongoing dialogue which, which occurs in the context of the legislation and the context of the relationship. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, October 7th, 2022. Monday will give way for the holiday to the slow documentary, Tripping the Niagara. It's a stunning three hour tour of Southern Ontario's beautiful Niagara region. Tuesday, are humans turning into plastic people? With more and more micropollution showing up in our bodies, Steve will look into that. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a terrific weekend, and Steve will see you on Tuesday. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.